Today's theme is Victorian Orientalism. This was a um, common and popular subject for Victorian painting, like the medieval and classical uh, subjects that were produced by artists. It provided a view of another world, but an imaginary view. It was a world constructed to satisfy the Victorians' um, expectations of the Orient. The models were often Western women. The scenes were set in the Middle East, often based on sketches the artist had made in the Middle East, but they rarely reflected life there. In England, and I'm talking today about Victorian Orientalism, the one of the main reasons for an interest in the Middle East was it was the site of many biblical stories. An artist wanted to see the landscape and cities themselves and people, uh, there was a demand for such paintings so that people could um, uh, have them on their walls and see them. Now, the most famous book on this subject is by Edward Said called Orientalism and he argues in this book that the Orient in Western literature and art is an artificial construction uh, based on what he believes is the West's patronising perceptions and fictional creations. He sees the Arab world as being presented by uh, Western artists as exotic, backward and uncivilised and at times dangerous. So um, constructed by the West based on their own fantasies. I, I should make it clear that his book is about the, the Middle East and little is said about China, Japan, uh, Southeast Asia, India and the other um, countries in Asia. Um, and Japan, for example, was a big inspiration for artists in the um, uh, middle of the Victorian period. And he says little, little about those ideas, but I think similar points apply to, for example, the Western representation of the Japanese geisha. But let's get started with um, one representation of the Orient by David Wilkie. David Wilkie was a well-known and respected British genre painter who left for the Holy Land in August 1840 when he was 55 because he wanted to see the costumes, customs, landscape at first hand in order to be able to paint them more accurately. When he reached Constantinople, he was delayed because there was a conflict, a war between the Pasha of Egypt in Syria, which Egypt controlled, and Turkey. Now, the British ended up allying themselves with Turkey and together they overthrew the Pasha at the Battle of Saint-Jean d'Arc. And this was a turning point in the relationship between Britain and Turkey and the victory enabled Wilkie to actually continue on to the Holy Land. This is um, an unfinished painting that he made of the um, uh, a messenger bringing the fall of um, Arca to the um, to Istanbul, Constantinople. The there was a joyous reaction in Constantinople at the news and it was a, a turning point in Orientalist painting. This is the first pro-Turkish painting in 19th century British art and it reflects a new attitude towards both Islam and the Turkish people. I incidentally some, I'm not sure I agree, but some have read in this painting a comment by Wilkie, or that Wilkie is making a comment on the segregation of the sexes in Islamic culture. Um, from the 1830s onwards, some of Wilkie's paintings 
like Queen Victoria presiding over her first council or the, perhaps the village festival, included what could be considered proto-feminist themes. And it's been suggested that Wilkie uh, disagreed with the segregation of women and he indicated that in this exclusively male society or male room here by including two young girls in the foreground. Now, as I said, he went on to the Holy Land. He stayed for five weeks in Jerusalem before returning to England by sea. But on the sea journey, he fell ill when the ship reached Malta. He remained ill, got worse on the trip to Gibraltar and died off the coast and was buried in the sea in the Bay of Gibraltar. Now, of course, representations of the Orient and the exotic the turbans, or Oriental portraits and so on, or portraits of uh, people from the Orient go right back to medieval period. Um, but let me just go back a shorter period, um, 100 years to the 18th century to make a point. It was common for paintings in the 19th century, as we'll see, to represent the slave market and the harem, and they were presented as decadent, exotic and primitive, uh, enabling Europeans to portray themselves as um, civilised and moral and powerful. And, um, of course, the slave market and the harem allowed European men to project their fantasies upon European women and in fact, their fantasies were enhanced by what they believed to be a representation of what was um, in reality happening in the Middle East. One of the first and first hand accounts of life inside a harem was by this lady, the 18th century noblewoman, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, because th this is... Um, a portrait by the French artist Jean Etienne Lyotard. She visited the Ottoman Empire with her husband, who was the British ambassador to the Sultan's court. And her letters are long and detailed and are a unique source on Turkish society at the time because she was admitted into the elite Turkish female society where no European male could go, including visiting the harem or harems. She wrote a description of the Grand Vizier's wife she visited. And interestingly, the Grand Vizier's wife lived in a very austere, sparsely furnished rooms and spent her whole day in prayer. However, she contrasted that with her description of the Grand Vizier's deputy and she describes his lavishly and beautifully decorated harem and his wife. Uh, for example, I'll just give you a brief extract from her letter. She wrote about his wife. Her beauty effaced everything I have seen, all that has become been called lovely, either in England or Germany. And I must own that I never saw anything so gloriously beautiful. I was so struck with admiration that I could not for some time speak to her, being wholly taken up in gazing. That surprising harmony of features, that charming result of the whole, that exact proportion of body, that lovely bloom of complexion unsullied by art, the unutterable enchantment of her smile... And so it goes on. So we have uh, enormous variety in the society, from austerity and prayer to lavish decoration and extreme beauty. This is um, another woman, a woman artist, who was allowed to visit a harem. Of course, under no circumstances were any men allowed inside, any uh, Western men. But Henriette Brown was allowed inside and here she shows um, what she saw. Uh, fully clothed women, ch children standing, 
they're all um, engaged in conversation, standing around chatting. Uh, incidentally, Henriette Brown was a pseudonym for Madame Jules de Sceau. Um, she was um, a... As an artist, she specialised in genre scenes, especially these um, uh, Middle Eastern scenes and religious subjects as well, and portraits, and was internationally renowned. Um, the, she, the reason she used a pseudonym is to keep her private life separate from her press, professional life, as she was the daughter of a count and the wife of a French diplomat, and it wasn't um, a done thing to be seen in society uh, or for a woman to be seen working. And a um, professional artist was um, a working job. Now, um, today I'm talking about um, art in the Victorian period. In other words, English artists or foreign artists who produced their work in England. But just one slide, I just wanted to show you um, some work that you might recognise uh, by French artists to sort of illustrate the difference. This is Jean-Léon Jérôme, The Slave Market, and Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres, The Turkish Bath. And um, they were, or these are the sort of paintings you might associate with Orientalism. But um, nude female figures were not unknown, but were unusual in English art. And in fact, when Jerome exhibited a similar painting called For Sale Slaves at Cairo at the Royal Academy in 1871, it was found wa widely found to be offensive. So the female nude was a common theme in French art, which I'll cover in another talk. But in England, most of the paintings concern costumes, customs and ancient biblical and historic landscapes and buildings. But, but of course, there's always an exception. So let me just briefly cover the, the exception. This is Ernest Normand, a, a, no, a well-known and notable English Victorian painter. He, he painted history paintings and Orientalist paintings like this one. He also painted um, portraits and he was influenced by the Pre-Raphaelites. Now, he married Henrietta Ray in 1884 and they both painted the nude in lush settings and their work, both of their works, were criticised towards a, a, for their tendency towards what was called excess of sensuality. They were both based in London. She kept, incidentally, her maiden name, Henrietta Ray, they both had a studio there and they were uh, friends of and uh, in the circle of um, Frederick Leighton, Lord Leighton. Henrietta Ray, this is a work by her, continued to be seen to be one of the leading late Victorian female artists, part of the classical revival and the foremost painter of the female nude in the pre-modern period. This painting was exhibited at the Royal Academy and it shows, it, interestingly, it shows Bacanti, that is, a follower of Bacchus, with unusually, and perhaps tellingly, the attributes of Bacchus himself. It was always Bacchus who was naked, except for a crown of vine leaves, and it was Bacchus who normally held the Thyrsus, a wand tipped with a pine cone that she's holding. But here, Ray has painted a woman with all the attributes of Bacchus. I incidentally, um, the reason I'm showing this mythological painting is that um, uh, nearly all her female nudes were mythological, not orientalist. So let's get on to a typical, in fact, le the leading Orientalist in Victorian Britain, John Frederick Lewis. And this is Coffee Bearer. We can see it's Oriental from the costume, from the minaret in the background. But she has Western features, as you see. Now he, Lewis, lived for 10 years in Cairo from 1851, sorry, 1841 to 51, 
where he adopted the local costume, stayed away from the Western community and painted watercolours and recorded the people in Cairo and the landscapes around. Um, he returned to England to discover that his work that he'd sent back was highly appreciated in England and he spent the rest of his life recreating oriental scenes from the sketches that he'd made during the 10 years in, Car in Cairo and the surrounding countryside. This is um, an example, the siesta. He built up a collection of some 600 sketches and he used them as the basis of his painting for the next 25 years of his career. Now he painted realistic genre scenes of Middle Eastern life, but they were idealised. He was very careful about his accurate representation of Islamic architecture and furnishings, and it set new standards of realism which influenced other artists. He never painted a nude. His wife, I think this is his wife here, modelled for several of his harem scenes. And Frederick Layton, his friend, described his harem as a place of almost English domesticity, women, women's fully clothed respectability suggests a moral healthiness to go with their natural good looks. And this is the harem, this is Lewis's interpretation of the harem, of course he never visited one. His interest is in the detail, the light, the intricate Islamic decoration. And in, in some ways in his painting, the figures are almost incidental. When he returned, not only did he bring his 600 sketches, he brought with him costumes, a huge collection of everyday items that he'd bought so that he could um, portray them exactly. The what's going on here is the woman on the right lounging back has had her hair prepared, I believe, by the woman kneeling next to her. And she's looking in a mirror held by the woman on the left to see the effects. The woman standing uh, perhaps is commenting on the effect or praising her. The woman on the far left is leaning over the open lid of this large chest, speaking to the woman on the floor who seems to be examining clothes she's taking out of the chest. This is a lady receiving visitors, the reception, which was originally titled, and this is significant, a lady receiving visitors, the apartment is the Mandara, the lower house of the floor, Cairo. It was painted some 25 years after he returned to England. And it depicts, as we know from the original title, a mandara on the first floor reception room. Now, uh, we see a meticulously detailed portrayal of the space. But we know that women were never permitted to enter the mandara. It was a room in which the man of the house would entertain uh, friends, uh, male colleagues, visitors. So... Here, it looks as if the lounging woman in the centre is welcoming a group of visitors on the left uh, who seem to be a, a group of three women and a child. Um, I think um, you could interpret this, as some have, of his depiction of women at ease in a masculine space. In other words, a comment on the restrictive treatment of Muslim women in Egypt and the Middle East. Um it also, incidentally, talking about restrictive practices, this same applied in Victorian Britain. So it could have been a subversive comment on the domestic restriction imposed on British women. But of course, equally, it could be that he was simply interested in the composition, the play of light. And the, the women in the painting are what we might call staffage. That is a word that means accessories or subordinate elements of the composition. By the way, gazelles, 
were a favourite Egyptian house pet and are included in several of his paintings, in case you're wondering. Painting of um, the main street of medieval Cairo. This is now in the Louvre. Uh, it was painted a year before he died, exhibited at the Royal Academy posthumously the year after he died, and it was it was sold, uh, resold, and eventually purchased by a wealthy American family who gave it to the Louvre in 2011. And it was based on a sketch Lewis had made some 25 years earlier, and we now ha we have the sketch. It's now in the Court Old Gallery. And what we see here is a bustling street. The on the right is a mosque and a madrasa, which is um, a sort of uh, educational establishment. On the left is a cenotaph of a sultan that dates back to 1516. And the man at the left is a sarath or, or money changer who seems to be examining something, uh, perhaps some some notes he's been given by the two women who are, are looking on anxiously as they lean forward. So, but let's um, move to one of the pre laphrolite artists, William Holman Hunt, one of the three founders of the pre laphrolite Brotherhood. Now, in 1854, or by 1854, he'd managed to sell enough paintings to finance a long trip to Jerusalem and the area around the Dead Sea. His motivation was that he was deeply religious and thought a trip to the land of Christ's birth essential for the creation of the religious paintings he wanted to produce. He wrote back home to say he'd started a life-size study of an Egyptian girl, the one on the left here, but the heat and dust and the difficulty of persuading the girl to pose prevented him from finishing the work. So he sent the canvas back to England and he completed it in England. And in fact, he completed two versions. The large one is in Southampton City Art Gallery and the smaller one in the Ashmolean. Um, he explained, you might wonder why it's called the afterglow. It's that time of the day. But he, he Hunt explained that he used that term. And this is from a letter he wrote from my choice of the hour, which seemed to me most picturesque for the figure of a girl, one of very many now seen in Egypt. So he's um, he's chosen the time of day. He's painted in the extreme detail of the pre raphaelites And um, for him, the extreme detail we see is has a moral significance as the more minute the detail, the more truthful the representation, and so the more accurately he was representing the works of God. So it had a moral and a religious significance for him. A more um, perhaps um, the amusing scene, a street scene in Cairo, it's called The Lantern Maker's Courtship. He, Hunt had a deep religious interest in the Middle East, as I said. He travelled extensively. He made contact with Islamic and Jewish communities. And in fact, he stayed in touch with them on his return to England. And this is a rare contemporary narrative scene. The, although the meaning of the narrative has been disputed. Some see, I mean, you can judge for yourself, some see the young woman as a willing participant in the young man's attempt to determine the outline of her face from outside the fail. He's, he's feeling her features. And those, point, those people point out her raised heel as a sign of acquiescence, as it suggests she's pushing herself forward slightly, and her left hand seems to be pulling his left arm towards her. On the other hand, some see the woman as fending off a forward young man, attempting to lift her veil, even though it's strictly forbidden in the Muslim world for a man to see his bride before the wedding. On a lighter note, in the background, and I've, I've 
boxed it in, highlighted it. Uh, we see a Westerner riding a donkey, beating his way up the street with a stick as he tries to pass a camel coming in the opposite direction. This is um, a very serious work by Hunt, the finding of the Saviour in the temple, uh, known as Christ among the doctors. Hunt was obsessed with revitalising religious art by accurately depicting biblical scenes. And here he shows the moment when Mary and Joseph find Jesus while the rabbis in the temple are reacting in various contrasting ways to his discourse, some intrigued, others angry, some dismissive. Incidentally, if you are interested in discovering more about this and the meaning behind it, um, I have PDF notes I, on, my, on the notes that are available and I summarise in those the pamphlet written by F.G. Stevens on um, Hunt's return that describes this painting in detail. He describes every rabbi, their personality, attitude and relationship to Christ. Uh, just as a brief example, the nearest rabbi on the left is described as an old priest, blind, imbecile and decrepit, clutches the Torah to himself, strenuously let feebly, his sight is gone, his hand seem palsied. He is the type of obstinate adherent to the old and effete doctrine, doctrine and pernicious refusal of the new. And the second rabbi next to him is leaning over in a good-natured, worldly individual with a feminine face who holds the phylactery box that contains the promise of the Jewish dispensation in one hand. Whereas the older man represents what the painter, what Hunt took to be an exhausted, feeble tradition, the, the good-natured man leaning over towards him won't allow himself to be troubled by any venturesome thoughts. So he's, he, whereas the, the first rabbi is dismissing Christ, the second is ignoring him. He's um, a good member of the establishment and, and Hunt um, saw him analogous to many of the Anglican, Anglican church clergymen in England. But moving on, as I said, there's a lot more behind that painting. Frederick Leighton, Light of the Harem. Now, Leighton was so interested in Islamic design that he actually constructed this Arab hall in his London home. It was designed by William Aitchison and was worked on by the potter William de Morgan, the artist Walter Crane, the sculptor Edgar Bohm and the artist Randolph Caldicott. And uh, um, so a lot of people were brought in by Leighton to help him construct this Arab hall. And Leighton had amassed an enormous collection of Japanese and Chinese objects over his lifetime. He took a, a an enormous interest in the culture of North Africa, the Middle East and Asia. Although some say his views on um, the Arabic culture over the African um, showed that his liking for Arabic over the African culture and some view his, his views on slavery were um, unalike, enlightened. He was born into a wealthy family in Scarborough and the wealth enabled him to travel around Europe, in fact travel around Europe almost continually. He studied art in Florence, he went on to Paris where he met Ang, Delacroix, Coro, Millet. He lived with a family in Germany. Um, in fact, over the years he travelled, visited and stayed in Austria, Algeria, Egypt, France, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Lebanon, Morocco, the Netherlands, Scotland, Spain, Switzerland, Syria and Turkey. So <laughs> he got around a bit. It was in 1857 he travelled to North Africa. And interestingly, his, his international experience and his multinational um, attitude 
made many in England suspicious. Suspicious of what, you might be thinking. They didn't, they wondered whether he was, quotes, fully British. Their attitude is best summarised by this anti-Semitic quote by the cartoonist George de Maurier. He wrote, he was convinced that in latent existed indications of foreign or Jewish blood. But I was quite unable to discover any facts in support of this theory and was troubled on this point. <laughs> no comment. Uh, this is a French artist, James Tissot, uh, but he painted this in London. He moved to London. Yeah, oh, sorry, he, he actually painted this in France, but he moved to London in 1871. Um, uh, but I thought I'd show it to you because he spent a long time uh, living and working in London. He served in the Franco-Prussian War and he moved to London just after, when the war finished. Um, he was a good friend of Whistler, which is one of the reasons I'm showing this, because the two had a mutual love of all things Japanese. And there was a craze for Japanese arts and goods no, known as Japanism, and it followed on from the reopening of foreign trade with Japan in 1858. Now Tiso often painted medieval, biblical and Japanese subjects as here. He painted few nudes and those he did paint appear, uh, well appear to me slightly awkward. He seems in this to be more interested in the Japanese kimono than the model and he's gone to great trouble and, and it, it, it seems um, pointed in a way in placing the edge of the kimono in exactly the right position. In fact, the model isn't Japanese at all, of course. She's one of his Parisian models that he used um, and he, he's um, uh, converted her, if you like, into a Japanese beauty by the use of the kimono. And he he bought a lot of uh, Japanese uh, artifacts, goods, clothing, and he purchased them, as, as many artists did, from a shop in Paris run by a, a Madame Louise Desso. And uh, Rossetti attended the shop as well and wrote to his mother when he was there that she, Madame Desso, described these three paintings by um, Tiso as the three wonders of the world, in her opinion, throwing Whistler into the shade. I, I wonder whether it's, um, I mean, she wasn't an art critic. Uh, I wonder whether it's just her opinion of um, uh, James Tiso, the French artist, in comparison to her opinion of the American artist Whistler. But they were friends. It was friendly competition between Whistler and Tiso, and both were inspired by Japanese work. Uh, Whistler, for example, painted the golden screen, the Lang Lysen of six marks, the princess from the land of porcelain, and this work, the Symphony in White, number two, the little white girl. Now, I'm stretching the term Orientalism a little as it's set in an English drawing room, but I included it to um, emphasise the point that in the 1860s and 70s, avant-garde artists and the general public, the, um, uh, the trendy middle class again, liked, um, liked Tissot and Whistler, fell in love with all things Japanese. So you see Japanese fans, Japanese vases, screens, all became trendy with the middle classes. Artists were inspired by the precision and flatness of Japanese prints and the way scenes and figures were positioned and they were often cut off at the edge of the picture. This is one of three paintings. In the first, Woman in White shows a woman that some critics speculated had just married and in this second painting we see here, um, some of those critics commented on the wedding ring that she's so prominently displaying on her left hand and the sad and careworn face reflected in the mirror. Well, that was their interpretation. 
It it has a dreamlike quality. She is thoughtful, um, and I I think Whistler would say there isn't intended to be any story. You can apply a story if you wish, and each person might create a different story. But he was interested in the composition, the balance, the design, the colour, the mood of the painting. It inspired Algernon Swinburne to write Before the Mirror. And I'd like to end with three landscape paintings, two by David Roberts. Many artists travelled to the Middle East and visited the locations described in the Bible and, of course, the most important location, the most important city was Jerusalem, often painted, and this painting by the Scottish artist David Roberts um, was um, one of six that he painted uh, from different viewpoints around Jerusalem. This is from the Mount of Olives. It was um, exhibited at the Royal Academy in, um, and, and he wrote, During Easter, Christian pilgrims from all parts of the East assemble at Jerusalem, from whence, accompanied by the governor and escorted by a strong guard, they proceed in a body to bathe in the River Jordan. The scene represents them coming in sight of the holy city on their return, and you can see crowds of people bottom right returning to Jerusalem. Another painting by Roberts um, from the south, uh, as I said, one of six paintings. Views of Jerusalem were keenly collected in England. One critic commented, the J Jerusalem seems his most popular landscape, possibly owing to the subject which will never cease to be sought with eager and reverential curiosity. That's from a magazine called um, The Athenaeum. However, I looked up the magazine of um, 1845 and it goes on to say there is much monotony in these eastern landscapes, as in Oriental tales. And the, art, the, the critic goes on to suggest the artist would be better off painting old English churches. So although views of Jerusalem were popular, they were clearly not to everyone's taste. I finish with an unusual and creative view of the Pyramids of Giza. This is by the well-known illustrator Edward Lear. He was born in North London to a wealthy family, but the family lost its fortune during the Napoleonic Wars shortly after he was born. Um, he had lifelong health problems. He was epileptic, depressed, suffered from depression, asthma, and later in life, partial blindness. However, by the age of 16, he was drawing for what he called bread and cheese. In other words, to make a, a small living. And he became a serious and well-known orthological illustrator. He was the first to draw live birds rather than birds from their skins. As his eyesight deteriorated, he turned to landscape and to travel. He visited Italy in 1842, Greece and Egypt, and then India in 1873. And he produced colour wash drawings that he later, on his return, turned into oil and some watercolour paintings. And, and, and those he turned into prints. And in the 1870s, he settled on the Ligurian coast in northwest Italy as his health was slowly deteriorating further. He declined more and more and died in 1888. Uh, by the way, he wasn't just um, an artist and illustrator. He was a very accomplished musician, author and poet probably best known today for his literary nonsense poems, particularly his limericks, which uh, was a, a form he popularised. Now, during his trip to Egypt, he wrote a letter back home 
The contemplation of Egypt must fill the mind, the artistic mind, I mean, with great food for, for the rumination of years. And this painting is a result of that contemplation. He was fascinated, unlike many artists, by modern Cairo as well as the ancient ruins. And here he neatly combines a unique view of the pyramids of Giza with a new road that was constructed across the floodplain. So the ancient technical achievements of building the pyramids are married with the modern day technical achievement of constructing an elevated roadway across the floodplain of the Nile. Both impress Lear as a continuing theme of human endeavour. So, that brings us to the end. Orientalism was a common and popular theme, as we've seen for Victorian painters. And the representation of the ancient world was, particularly when it was representing uh, society, was an artificial creation, an imaginary world. It was fueled in England by religious belief, ex some times by exotic fantasies and beliefs about life in the Orient. As we've seen in England there were few paintings of slave markets with naked female figures. Their harems when they painted them were filled with demurely clothed women. But in my next talk I will cover French Orientalism um, which has got a very uh, different uh, inspiration and background and subject matter. In the meantime, thank you for your time and hopefully I'll see you back again soon. Goodbye for now.